uh, was working for a company that, that was doing uh, educational development materials. And I was called into, ironically, Jersey City State College uh, for a, an audiovisual individualized type of a remedial reading program. And I asked the uh, instructor that I was speaking to, I said, well, I'm kind of curious as to why you would want to have this program. And I thought they were looking at it from a standpoint of new technology, how to present phonics or whatever reading technique there was. And I said, so why, like, why are you looking at this? And she said, well, it's for our students. And I said, well, yeah, I know it's for your students, but I mean, in terms of how you're going to use it in the classroom, what? He said, no, you don't understand. It's for our students. So the other said, so our students come into us reading at about a fourth grade level, and they want to be teachers. And I said, you're kidding me. And she said, there's only one thing worse. I said, what's that? We're graduating them. Go ahead, uh, down, down, down. Uh, Despite uh, that gloomy overview, I'm actually more optimistic about uh, education reform today than I've been in the last uh, 30 years. And the reason is very simple. It is a matter of uh, finance. And the fact is, we are very simply uh, broke. And yet, people do not grasp, as some of the remarks uh, here illuminate, uh, the truth of what we are spending. The average state spends 47% of its general fund on K-12 uh, education. The average local jurisdiction below state level spends on average 67% of its uh, revenue on uh, K-12 education. So that means nationwide, uh, that is more than three out of every five dollars is going to a single budgetary category. And I stress the need to think of education as an entitlement. Uh, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid are in terrific shape compared to K-12 education. But only if you think of K-12 education as an entitlement can you get people to accept the fact that this thing just is not uh, sustainable. I found an interesting new career of late being an expert witness on uh, school education finance uh, lawsuits. And the astounding thing is you're in an impossible situation financially and yet all across the country, the education establishment is going to court with the same song. We need more money. Do it for the kids. Judge, help us. You mentioned thorough and efficient. We just finished a trial uh, in Colorado, a $5 billion lawsuit. Uh, there we call it uh, thorough and uniform. And uh, we, lost, we lost that case. And uh, the judge has created an impossible situation. And this is happening all across the country. So the Democratic governor, and most of the people I consult with now are Democrats because they're in more trouble, said, look, there is no money. We're not going to pay it. And this is causing a bipartisan consensus. It astounds me, the responsiveness. I get equal responsiveness from Democratic and Republican uh, legislatures because, uh, as uh, I always love that line of Andrew Cuomo's, uh, I'm, I'm a liberal who's broke. I need a new idea. So the new idea is a radically different kind of education. If the other 19 industrial nations in the world can do better education for much less cost, what in God's name is wrong with us? It is time to wake up and realize that uh, a new day has to dawn or we, as Lucy used to say, we'll have a lot of explaining to do to our children and grandchildren. I, I was going to mention the bipartisan quality uh, a little bit later, but since Bill brought it up, let, let's talk about that. Um, there are a number of prominent Democrats who have become education reformers, Andrew Cuomo being one, Rahm Emanuel in Chicago, the mayor there being another. Uh, Cory Booker, of course, a Democrat for a while, has been uh, an education reformer. Um, and in fact, in Colorado in particular, I just want to say something that I couldn't believe when I learned, which is this week, in this event that's going to be happening in Denver, the equivalent of this, the teachers union, the CEA, is showing up to support school choice. It's the only place in the country that this has happened. And it has dumbfounded most of us in the planning board of the National School Choice Week. And so that's something of note. I don't know quite what to make of it, quite frankly, but. Uh, it is happening, it is increasingly bipartisan. On the other hand, there are some recalcitrant uh, Democrats who seem to be uh, against reforms of all kind. Jerry Brown in California being one, 
and, and, and many others. So, do you want to have any thoughts on, on the bipartisan nature of it? Well, in New Jersey, it's been kind of odd because we've had a situation recently where uh, State Senate President Steve Sweeney has said that he would post the governor's initiatives um, for education. Now, of course, because he said that, he got zero donations from the NJEA. But he also had a carrot too. He says, I'll post them, but I won't support them. So he wants to have it both ways. The most interesting, though, was with the, uh, the Opportunity Scholarship Act, when that was being bandied about. Uh, State Senator Shirley Turner from the city of Trenton said that um, she's opposed to the idea of these because they're vouchers. And she said that it's not the way we should go. However, if it passes, I want Trenton included in the pilot program. So, you, know, you don't know what to make. The, the Democrats have a real problem because it's their core constituency who wants school choice. And so, that we have a prime opportunity here in the state to take advantage of the Democrats, like, like Senator Lesniak, uh, who, is, who are promoting these school choice ideas and start to drive a wedge between uh, the Democrat legislators and the unions. Uh, and Rosa, just like last week, Mayor Bloomberg offered in his State of the City address proposals for a $20,000 merit pay for teachers who are rated in the highest category two years in a row, for forgiving $25,000 worth of student loan debt to the highest performing students in, uh, who decide to become teachers. Yeah, and that all comes, of course, from the uh, race to the top uh, money that need to be, uh, you know, certain standards and certain, uh, they have to meet certain requirements. And one of the requirements is to reform uh, teacher evaluations and uh, tie it in. They're trying to tie it in somehow to the merit pay. But uh, you, again, you're going to get pushback from uh, the teacher, uh, the teachers union because they do not want to tie in merit pay to a, a base performance. Um, you know, if you were working for a corporation, your bonus is directly tied in to your performance. Um, I say, if you are a prepared and you are an extremely um, dedicated professional um, within the teaching realm, you should have zero fear of having a school-based uh, performance initiative started at your school. And, no, it's absolutely, it's amazing. Well, there was a revolt. <laughs> there was a revolt. And, you know, immediately my union mobilizes. Um, I, I, I recently met with my union representative um, and I told her that I was fed up with the ways of old and I was demanding a coalition uh, for the conservative teachers, of which there are many. There are many conservative teachers, they're just in the shadows. Uh, they're hiding and they don't want to come out because they are afraid, they're afraid of the repercussions. Um, the time is now because our kids are failing and when we have when we're placing 28 among, you know, industrialized nations in math, and we can't, uh, you know, top ever top five, uh, those those days are gone, and we need to regain some sort of, of validity for our profession. And this is the way to do it: to tie in the performance-based initiative. Okay, go ahead. And then we kill you with these bipartisan immigrants. Tell me your reaction. You're uh, suspicious. No, uh, well, yeah, there is some suspicion, but I want to point out when we were working in California, we would have uh, teachers come up to us after our debates, et cetera, and say, you know, I really like this, but I can't get this approved. My union won't let this happen. As I said, there's a, that's the other asset that's being wasted here. What I'd like to know from the panel, Bob, and from all of us, is to what extent uh, this event is called National School Choice Week, to what extent do the panelists, most of whom are in professional education, feel that true choice should be offered to the citizens of the country? That means removing the choice about education from the professional education class and putting it in the hands of parents where it has been since the earth cooled. I'll, I'll start with an answer on that. The first thing you need are strong charter school laws which means there has to be something in the state whereby you can have the possibility of getting chartered through your district, but it's usually better to go through a state chartering authority that is friendly to charter schools. So that's the first thing you would want. The second thing you would want is to be able to get out from under these laws when it comes to teacher hiring and things like that, which I've already mentioned, the certification issue is big. 
The third thing we want is real autonomy when it comes to um, uh, curriculum and things like that. For example, there's usually in good states, in states like Arizona and Colorado, when you have a lot of latitude in, as far as what kind of charter school you want to set up, you can have all these waivers where you waive these ridiculous state requirements. Uh, but in states that don't have very favorable charter school laws, you can, be you can be required, even though you're a charter school, to do the state sex education program, for example, which is not what you want your kids going through. Um, it's not absence space, but let's put it that way. And, and just tons and tons of requirements that even the charters can't get out from under. Uh, so those are the kind of things that a state needs to put in place so that it can actually be a charter-friendly school. If those regulations are not put in place, then the charter school just becomes slightly better than a regular public school. Uh, so I, and this is something that I, I, I know um, former commissioner from Colorado would speak to, uh, because in fact he told me in his office one time that one of the early you one of the early union people in Wisconsin, or maybe it was Minnesota, who was against charter schools, basically gave a directive to all his workers under him that said. Uh, uh, crush them if you can, co-opt them if you must. So there's a real danger in making sure that charter schools are truly choice uh, and, and not just a reproduced uh, public school with, with a, lot, a lot of money coming their way. That was actually Al Shanker, though it's been passed on by various, uh, various other folks. And I, I might parenthetically note to Bob, uh, there may be less uh, than what meets the eye, uh, that item going on out, out in Colorado. So many of union initiatives like that are really stealth campaigns in which they try to give the appearance of being on the side of reform because they're under tremendous pressure. But I'm often asked, what is the worst education reform in the last half century? And in answering that, it also tells you what is the single most valuable initiative that can be taken across uh, this country? And uh, in answering this, unless you are able to look at American education in an international context, you cannot begin to understand what, uh, what uh, went uh, wrong. The worst reform of the last half century, and this is counterintuitive, is class size reduction. We have made a fetish of that. And it seems to make, it seems to make uh, sense. In 1960, student-teacher ratio in this country was, 20, was 27 to 1. Pretty much the same as similar to other industrial nations. Uh, today, it's about 15 to 1. The question is, what happened and why? Just ask yourself, what is the union perspective? Well, more teachers means more members. More members means more dues money. More dues money means more political clout. More political clout means more members, and, uh, and so on. Right now, and I often quote my friend Chester Finn of the Fordham Foundation, in fact, there's about a million more teachers than we need. Now, that is costing us money that reaches up in, into the trillions over, over time. Those nations who are beating us uh, overseas they routinely have class size twice what we have in, in the United uh, States. And uh, they do a better job. Now, of course, you say, well, that doesn't make sense uh, to, to the public, because the public isn't familiar with the research. The public is not familiar with circumstance in other nations. Uh, I like to be provocative when I sit down with our Colorado legislature. So I said to the chairman, Tom Massey, I said, he said, well, you know, you come by and talk to us. I said, yeah, would you like it if I came in and I will identify a billion dollar saving? It'll only take me five minutes, and if you do what I say, you will save a billion dollars. And he laughed and said, yeah, sure, that's, that sounds uh, good. And I said, all you have to do is emulate the state of Utah, where pupil-teacher ratio is 23.7, Colorado is 16.8. The difference between those two numbers is a billion dollars. Now, if teachers are properly trained, uh, let's say having larger class size is not a problem. When I started teaching six classes of problems of democracy, I'm not going to tell you how long ago, I had 231 students on my roll. I 
six classes range from 36 to 44. It can be done, but until we start training our teachers and selecting them, when I travel abroad, the most frequent question I'm asked is, Bill, what is a school of education? America is the only country in the world that has schools of education. Uh, in other countries, those who would teach pursue academic degrees in academic uh, institution. And those nations in the recently released PISA study, they get their teachers from the top 5% to 30% of the high school class. It's even, and what they do then is invest seriously in training those people. We have no means of quality control with our teachers. People are self-selected. You want to teach? Go to school of education. Spend some time, they'll give you a piece of paper, you'll give them a lot of money, and then you'll go see uh, an administrator who will uh, offer you a job if you can affirmatively say, I am certified and I can coach. Oh, okay, that's all we need to know. So teaching is at the heart of this dilemma, but it is a very hard sell because uh, parents go, oh, but wait a minute, large class sizes. I was talking to a woman in Colorado Springs recently, she said, my daughter cannot learn in a class over 25. And I said, I know you, Doris. Now, isn't your son up at the University of Colorado in Boulder? Well, yes, yes he is. Do you know that his science class has 300 students in it? Oh, well, hmm, 18, 19, you know, what's wrong with this picture? We've been brain brainwashed around that issue. We're paying a tremendous price for it. And it hurts teachers. Average teacher salary would be much higher in this country if we had far fewer teachers, uh, better selected and better trained. Yeah, actually, the issue's been floated before. What if we uh, double teacher salaries and double class sizes? And what would that do to education? And by the way, we get rid of the worst half and keep the best half and just have the classroom be twice as big. And they can be paid twice as much. And it really confuses the, the unions when you tell them this. Um, in, in a second, 
But it said in the decision, it said in that only the legislature, now this, remember, this is the New Jersey Supreme Court saying this now in 1992, says that only the legislature has the authority to appropriate funds and that they are loath, was the exact word they used, to tread or go in or get into uh, that particular aspect in, uh, in terms of the Constitution. And they also quoted another uh, particular decision uh, which went a little bit further, but in essence said that uh, they're not going to do anything as it relates to who has the authority to appropriate funds and initiate legislation. Now, what is ironic about that is that that was a decision in 1992 led by the Wallens Court, which was arguably one of the most liberal courts to have ever served in the state of New Jersey, and that particular decision was 7-0. It was a unanimous decision. Yet you go further, and now you have the courts. Ironically, not only are they, as Bob said, uh, dictating what the legislature should be doing, but when it comes to education, they are telling them how much money they need to spend, when in fact a previous court said only the legislature has the authority to appropriate funds, but the court are telling you how much to spend. Okay, so yeah. In particular, last year, the court said the gov Governor Christie was not spending enough on education. They just decided his dollar amount to right. was, in their opinion, the wrong dollar amount. Well, that was, the, the interesting part about that decision is that it was a 3-2 decision basically because there was a vacancy. There were a couple of court, the justices had to recuse themselves and they had to bring in a, a judge up from the from the lower bench to sit in to, to cast the deciding vote. So basically it was 2-2, so actually it, it should not have been decided. But that was, uh, if there's any great examples of judicial misconduct that happens in New Jersey is always at the cost of the taxpayers. But I want to jump on something real quick about the uh, class size. Uh, Dr. Mark Smith, who formerly was at the College of New Jersey, and he was an uh, expert in educational research, and he always said, you pick any number between 14 and 65, and he will conduct a study to prove that that is the appropriate class size. That's how, that's how you know, easy it is to make this up. And, that's, and I would say after class size, the worst thing we ever did in education in this country was create the Federal Department of Education. I think that's number two. I'm sorry. And I think, uh, you know, another horrible decision that the um, being uh, of Latina heritage is, do you remember the Aspira um, versus uh, the city of New York where bilingual education came in? And uh, because they felt that it was important that our children be given separate um, instruction in their native language to support uh, the culture. But I have to tell you that in New York City, also in New Jersey, the bleed out from these programs called um, you know, they are the tier one schools where the funding, this came from Lyndon Johnson's great uh, education reform, another great, uh, you know, the war on poverty, um, wonderful, wonderful uh, reform. But it's just amazing how much money is bled out for, uh, for programs that support ESL, L students. Um, you know, your, your, your children in public school, I can tell you, are being shortchanged because most of the monies are being also just, just given, funneled into the support for native language speakers, um, non-native non -native, not language speakers. My big thing is, it's amazing how there's support for the Hispanic, um, but you know, I have Bengali children and Chinese children who get zero support, yet they are thriving, and I just did gifted and talented testing, and all of the students that do not speak English, that are Bengali and Indian and Chinese, are thriving. So this is another area that I think we need to look at and really try to take back the reins of. When I came into the public school, I did not speak a word of English because my parents were Dominican. Um, my father said, sink or swim. You are going to learn how to speak the language. Um, that's how you become an American. What a concept.
now have states like Arizona, where there's 12 percent of insurance starters. Cities like New Orleans, actually there are no other cities like New Orleans, but 80 percent of kids are now in charter schools. They're the only cities over half. And in fact, if you think about the normal uh, funding argument saying that these uh, charters, these vouchers, will be draining money from the real schools, we, this is a terrible thing, we'll be draining money off of these few satellite charters. When that whole argument is inverted that the charters are the fault of the majority, it does, it, it does uh, paint a completely different uh, picture with respect to the funding scenario. So uh, your, your sense of where charters are now, how are they perceived as race to the top changes, and will the growth rates that double digits continue? Sure. Uh, charters, uh, from our standpoint, are a, a key element of, uh, of education reform. Uh, one of the things you've got to understand about charter schools is that it, uh, it, it gives a lot of uh, control locally, which of course is what the design is. That's one of the fundamental principles of uh, American public education uh, since the founding. But uh, it, it's a, it's a double-edged sword in that uh, there are uh, good charter schools and uh, not so good charter schools. Uh, most of this is a function of the ideas uh, and the philosophy that's incorporated in how the schools uh, are, are developed and designed. Uh, but the whole point is, is that it's, uh, it's the alternative to the failing public schools. So someone might say, well, they're just an experiment and, and half of them fail. Well, that's fine. We're gonna, uh, the whole process uh, filters up those that, uh, that do succeed because all of the, virtually all of the public schools are failing, just like Dr. Moore said earlier. So, uh, a 50% success rate is better than a 0% success rate. So charter schools uh, are a critical element of, of education reform in this country, and I think they need to continue to be promoted and uh, supported in the states. And they also provide the, uh, the, the inroads to uh, break up the, uh, the forces that are working against education reform, such as uh, things that are happening in the, the teachers' unions and in the colleges of education. I thought this would be a good time to actually get a little audio-visual portion of the uh, proceedings here. Uh, this is let me get the right tab open. This is a video that we did. Um, it involves, well, you'll see it's a principal of a charter school in Atlanta called Ivy Prep, and it tells her story. It's just a couple minutes long. You guys can have to crane your necks around a bit. Sorry about that. It's like being in the first row of the movie theater for you guys. No, it's worse than that. Yeah. <laughs>
incidental or a few bad apples kind of thing. This is over 170 teachers in one school district who all admitted to cheating because it was so statistically verifiable in the context of these tests. And so that that's, that was its own that was its own story. That this, you know, we have all we have them all around the country. Go ahead, go ahead and build this on a word of background to say on charters. Charters get their foot in the door simply because the establishment is terrified of vouchers and uh, the movement is prospering. Uh, there's a footnote to the New Orleans story. It said, well, wait a minute, how did they get 70% of all schools becoming charter schools? Well, it took Hurricane Katrina uh, to, to do that. But the state legislature, and, and this is stunning, uh, the reason they're succeeding, the state legislature nullified the collective bargaining agreement of all school employees, teachers, non-teaching employees. I mean, that is revolutionary, and only uh, the shock of Katrina uh, led even a conservative uh, Southern legislature uh, to do that. But what that tells you is that the, the key to the issue is all about politics. If you don't solve it, Politically, you're not going to solve it uh, educationally. And interestingly, when you talk to foreigners, particularly in Europe, it is impossible to explain to them what a voucher is uh, because they're routine over there. So, but, but, but Bill, America's democracy, are you saying Americans can't choose their child's school? And Europeans learn out of about 300 years of religious wars that it is. Uh, much better to just let people send their kids to the school you know that they that they believe in so our opposition to vouchers is not only irrational on its face it is atypical uh, of the world i like to say for those who consider vouchers a kind of right-wing idea which is called brand in such america uh you, have, you need to bring up their sweden the right-wing country sweden with their uh, single payer health care plan and uh, you know they have vouchers in that for years very well. Canada, how, you know, with their single payer health care plan, they have private, uh, public money going to private uh, Catholic schools uh, uh, all over the country. So it's, uh, go ahead. Bob, I was going to say, uh, it is a right wing idea, but that's because the right wing is ahead on everything. Uh, I had a question before that I don't think we fully explored. This is National School Choice Week. As uh, Dr. Mahoney said, Every industrialized country in the world has a voucher system. Every one, except the United States. Just in some form of vouchers, you have choice. Uh, you, you just brought up a couple. Yeah, if, when, yeah in, in, uh, in this discussion and a lot of discussions and panels on school choice, we devolve into solving technical issues, minor tweaks in the existing system. I know that's the system we have, we work within it, but I still wanted to know what, among the uh, board members, uh, panel members here, what is their support or resistance to real choice? Now, by real choice, I mean you get your tax money and you take it anywhere you want to educate your child, and after uh, the school year, the child passes a standardized test. To me, that's real choice, and I want to see what kind of support we have for that. I'll just um, <laughs> inject something. I don't know whether this is called support or not. Um, last year, when they were trying to uh, pass the uh, voucher program in New Jersey, they referred to it as the Opportunity Scholarship Act. Uh, I was called on to testify uh, on behalf of the bill, except that uh, Chris was taken aside and then came back with a message for me that when I testify, whatever I do, call it the Opportunity Scholarship Act. Do not call it vouchers, because if I do, the Democrats won't vote for it. Don't use the V word. Yeah. Cannot use the V word. Yeah. We have a new word that we cannot use. We cannot use the V Dick, word. Dick, I know you're a politician. You still haven't said whether you support vouchers or not. Say that again? Do you support vouchers or choice? I, I testified in favor of it, and, and, and I also and, and I and I also the original sponsor of New Jersey's Charter School Act. So you believe that a, a citizen should be able to take their tax money, not send it to the public school system, 
take it to whatever school they would like to take it. Absolutely. It's the student, it's the parent's choice. Who is better able to make a choice for their kids than their own parents? Exactly. Yeah, I'm 100 percent for choice as well, and it goes back to the fact I went to the University of Virginia, so I go back to the Jeffersonian principle, whereas education should be controlled locally because he believed that the parents knew best how to educate their children, and that, I mean, so I'm 100 percent in favor of choice all the way. Yes, and, and, and the key to that is, uh, it's a simple act of imitation. Uh, this is done routinely in other nations. And I know we're very proud of our country and for some, oh, you copy foreigners? Yeah, if they've got a better system than we do, yeah, let's copy uh, foreigners. But their system is so dramatically different than ours in its governance. So I, just, I was just, I just yes. to clarify that, but it's my sense that Terrence Moore, the common core curriculum is a movement to create A little nervous. A little nervous might be a good thing. Well, and here's the reason. Uh, I, I fully embrace the principle uh, that you could come up with a very good national core and not using state initiatives, but just doing it on his own. That's what E.D. Hurst has been doing for the last 20 years, and he puts forth a solid curriculum. Uh, however, what happens when you uh, start saying, we need to have a national curriculum, uh, a couple of things happen. Number one, the feds are going to have to get involved in some way. Now, the way that it was done recently, if, if you all saw this, this was a couple of years ago, when states adopted these voluntary national standards. And so it looked like it was being done at the state level. But as soon as that done, that's done, then the feds step in and say, oh, we have these national standards, let's, help, let's let us help you out with that. And I think that's a violation of local control of schools, uh, which has gone on too long, uh, since the Eisenhower had our administration in Sputnik. Um, Well, well, because here's what's going to happen. These people are smart, okay? Progressive education is the right arm of the progressive movement. Um, this, is, this is a political issue because the idea, well, notice, for example, that most um, well-to-do Democrat politicians do not send their kids to the public schools. They go to very ritzy private schools, and uh, those kids are learning how to speak. And those kids are learning English in the proper ways. And it's true that their history classes are going to be kind of leftish, but nonetheless, they're getting a pretty good education. What if you were satisfied if you looked over this set of curriculum? Well, but I, went, I, looked, I did look at the curriculum, and here's what goes on. First of all, you don't, it's like any of these other standards. You say, you should, have, you should read a very complex literary text in the 10th grade, such as, and they give you a list of books that you could read. What happens is, they're going to start getting control of those such as's. And the, the schools, which just follow these things slavishly, will start looking at the books that are on the list, and increasingly that's going to become a more radical reading list. It's acceptable right now. So people like Chester Finn said, I looked at the standards, they look pretty good. I looked at the standards, and I thought they were either weaker than the things that, that our, our school was already doing, or there were these weeks towards, here's really what we're going to do. So you're not, you're not seeing anything right now no, there, there, no there, are a few, there are a few things. There are a few things. And if you look at it closely, uh, for example, some of the reading lists, it's very clear that they're not just trying to find the great American classics. They're trying to find a few great American classics, and you have to have a certain number of black women and possibly lesbian, gay, bi you know, bisexual authors as well. That's already existing, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to continue in that direction. We're doing it. We are involved in the process of setting, uh, doing our carbon core learning, learning standards. Um, Edie Hirsch had it right, they do not. And this is what you need to be aware of, that the quality, the access, the equality issue that is seeping into the common core curriculum. You're exactly correct, where they're trying to balance yeah, some of that classic stuff that we need to learn, but make no mistake about it, there is an agenda, 
and I am just against a one-size-fits-all curriculum for any kid because, again, we are individuals and you're going to tell me that the kid in Topeka is learning what the kid in Brooklyn is learning and needs to learn it at the same time? I'm having an issue with just that alone. We're talking about the government here involved at a, at, a, at a level. And do you know what's going to happen? It's exactly correct. I think there's going to be tainting um, and persuasion on, that, that will take hold of this, of this common core curriculum, and we won't recognize it. Okay, so Phil, I'm just, you, you, go ahead. Yeah, uh, it's, we should not be divided on this. There is not a necessity for, for a national uh, curriculum. And uh, uh, Terrence's, uh, absolutely correct and suspicious of what's going on now in the national standards. If you just look who's putting that together, uh, that's, that's enough to frighten uh, anyone. The key is the accountability, and the key to accountability uh, is a test. People forget, when No Child Left Behind first turned up uh, in the U.S. Congress, uh, it was written so that every state would have the National Assessment of Educational Progress, NAEP, would be uh, let's say, the barometer. Now, if that had been done, you would have at least a common standard uh, to measure. The 50 states could do whatever they pleased. No need for a national curriculum. However, as and Terrence knows Bob Schaefer, who was in the Congress at that time, that was a political no-fly zone. No way you were going to get the national test for all of the political reasons. And so what they did was absolutely insane. They said, well, all right, every state can pick whatever test they like, and they can also define proficiency any way they like, and they also can set the cut score, meaning the passing score. And that was the end. Uh, the whole thing descended into a jumble of high, high cost. So you don't need a national curriculum, but what other nations have, not so much a national curriculum, but the test. Now, if you've got a good test, then a private school, a public school, the kind of school advocated so admirably at Hillsdale College, you should be able to do that, confident that your kids will probably do pretty well uh, on, on that uh, test. But we are so confused on that issue, and tests have been demonized uh, that we're just paying a, a, a terrible price for that. I understand where my friend Checker Finn is at. I served on Hershey's core knowledge board for 20 years, you know, from, from the beginning. Hang out a high quality program, which is what core knowledge uh, is. When I was superintendent in Calvert County, Maryland, we became the first public school district in the nation to adopt core knowledge, you know, as their uh, elementary curriculum. But, the national idea, you just kind of get into a political hailstorm. It isn't worth it. What you need is accountability. Right, so when the Obama administration says you can get a waiver for NCLB, don't try to look behind, if you agree to certain things you'd like, including common core for your state, and that's part of their algorithm or decision matrix for awarding these waivers, you're against that. You're telling us that you're part of the Not, not the way uh, that we're doing it now. I mean, it's been utterly politicized. Uh, race to the top has become a joke. Uh, the distribution was effectively decided by the NEA and the AFT, as we in Colorado learned uh, to our great uh, sorrow. And the head of the NEA came out and told us, you passed that accountability law, and you can forget about race to the top. He was right.
this, you know, this past election. What did they buy? Billboards, COVID ads? Uh, most, of, most of them were direct uh, contributions to the individual candidates' campaigns, like Barbara Walter and all those who oppose all the choice uh, initiatives. The other interesting thing I saw this year, which I hadn't seen before, they were also just contributing very heavily to county Democrat organizations and municipal Democrat organizations, as well as freeholders. And what that tells me is they're afraid that, we're, that well, we're not afraid, they want to have the public vote as to whether or not you can have a charter school in your town. So they want to get into the Democrat organizations, individual towns, so they can control whether or not the, these various towns and counties have charter schools. don't like giving up my vote on the school budget. I mean, I, I hold that near near, I vote no every year. Uh, <laughs> so I, I take it as a personal offense. But uh, the, the school elections were traditionally a, an industry secret. I mean, they were called, what, the third Tuesday in April and all this. And so basically it was all arranged so that only those who are somehow connected to the system and come out and vote. That way you're sure that the budgets will get passed all the time. They've even gone as far as to get members of the NJEA to become board members in the towns where they live in, not where they teach, but where they live in. So basically they're controlling both the labor and management side of things in a lot of towns. Um, and they always wanted to keep, they, they wanted to keep the whole uh, school board elections from being politicized because they thought that if they were voting for the candidates at the partisan election time, then you know you will have your Republican slate, your Democrat slate, and that's not the way it should go. But what they were really fearing was that the budget would also be in the November referendum, and they know that you know more than likely in New Jersey it would go down even bigger than they have been in the past couple of years. So they got their trade on.